In our next classical concert, we hear music by three of the greatest German composers, the three Bs, Bach, Beethoven and Brahms. In the 18th century, musicians were very familiar with a large range of dancers which had French names like Allemande, Courant, Gavotte and Gigue. And before the symphony, the main kind of instrumental music was a suite made up of these different dancers. Bach wrote four orchestral suites and we'll be playing the third, which he wrote in 1729. But Bach didn't call it an orchestral suite. He referred to the suite by the name of the first movement, which was Overture. This particular movement is based on the French overture, which has two parts, the first slow with dotted rhythms and the second fast with lots of fugal entries coming in on top of each other. So we start with an overture, then Bach breaks the mold and writes an air, a song, instead of a dance, then a gavotte, a bourrée and a gigue. The second movement, the air or song, is an elegant, heartfelt melody full of nobility that's been loved for centuries. In fact, you might know it by its nickname, Air on the G-String. Now, what does that mean? In the 19th century, some violinists played the whole melody on the lowest string of the violin as a kind of performance stunt. But this wasn't how Bach wanted it to be played at all. And since then, we've learned a lot through period performance about what Bach actually wanted to hear when he heard his own music performed. So come to our concert to hear the Air on the G-String and the rest of the third orchestral suite, just as Bach intended. In 1822, Beethoven composed an overture for the opening of the Josefstadt Theater in Vienna. Named the Consecration of the House, it's unique since Beethoven wrote it for the revival of a play that would open the new theater. Beethoven was a huge fan of Handel. Along with Mozart and J.S. Bach, Handel was his goat. In fact, he even said that Handel was the greatest composer ever to live. He wanted to write an overture in Handel's style. Just like the Bach overture in the suite, the consecration of the house is also a French overture, which means that it has two sections. First of all, a slow and stately introduction with lots of dotted rhythms, and then a fast fugal section. Beethoven was obsessed with fugue in his later life. And it's a device where one simple melodic idea is played and then imitated by another instrument and then another piling on top of each other in a very exciting dense web of counterpoint. In his final decade, Beethoven composed only three orchestral works, the Ninth Symphony, the Missa Solemnis, and this overture, The Consecration of the House. All the grandeur and spiritual ecstasy of the Ninth and the Missa Solemnis are present in this overture. It's a work of great excitement and great speed, and Beethoven himself loved it, choosing it to open one of his most successful benefit concerts for himself in Vienna in 1824. But despite that, it's actually relatively rarely played. So we can't wait to share this unusual masterpiece with you. Few pieces cost their composer as much blood, sweat and tears as Brahms' first piano concerto. He began it in 1854 as a symphony in tribute to the composer Robert Schumann, who was his mentor and who had predicted that Brahms would become a great composer. Then it became a two piano sonata and finally a piano concerto as Brahms wrestled with his difficulty in writing for the orchestra. Brahms was by then only 25 and the concerto stands as one of his earliest masterpieces, intensely moving and ferociously difficult. The first movement inhabits the same massive, yearning, life and death atmosphere of the first movement of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, which was certainly in Brahms' ear as he wrote the piece. It's intensely dramatic music characterized by ferocious trills in both of the soloist's hands. The second movement is one of Brahms' most beautiful, a yearning portrait of Clara Schumann, wife of Robert, with whom Brahms was passionately in love at the time. And the finale is a fast, robust and muscular rondo, eventually giving way to a freer spirit. Despite its place at the center of today's repertoire, the concerto was given a terrifying reception at its premiere in Leipzig in 1859, when Brahms, the soloist, 
was met with stony silence as he stood up from the piano. Now that might be because of a funny mistake in the parts. The concerto begins with a timpani roll marked forte piano, very loud, then very soft, and the soft roll continues for a long time. But the timpanist part didn't have the piano, so instead he just played forte as loud as possible the whole way through the first movement, drowning out absolutely everything else. A disastrous occasion, Brahms never forgave Leipzig, refusing to turn for years even after the concerto had made a success everywhere else. Through the long and tortured compositional process, Brahms created one of the most powerful concertos in the repertoire. So join us and Jacksonville favorite pianist Alessio Bax for a performance of Brahms' first concerto that you won't forget.